Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. In this video, I'm going to show you some helpful functions that I've created in Python that make use of pandas, in particular for pre-processing data that you want to send into Keras or perhaps some other deep learning type neural network. Now this pre-processing is typically for predictive analytics type data where you've got a couple of or perhaps many columns that are categorical or continuous values and you want to transform them. Now if you're dealing with images or high dimension, other high dimensional data type like audio, you'll use entirely different methods to pre-process this. This is dealing with named fields where you want to encode categoricals, encode so like textual values, numeric values, and other things. So I will, this is used heavily in my applications of deep learning um, class. However, you can use this for really any sort of project where you want to encode this sort of data. Now there's a whole lot of different ways that you can encode data to go into TensorFlow. It depends really on the volume of data. If you, this is really, if you're dealing with data sets that fit into pandas nicely, pandas is definitely not the only way to prepare this sort of data. PySpark is sort of the method of choice that I use for bigger data sets. But this shows you these functions and how they're used. So if you, if you go to my GitHub repository for my class, I have them all here. Now you don't have to be in my class to make use of these. These are functions that are that are useful for any sort of uh, encoding from pandas type data into Keras. These are the functions. So I give you a URL to this in in the description of this uh, video, but we're going to go ahead and I'm going to show you how to set this up really pretty much from scratch. So the first thing we're going to do is create a new Python 3 notebook. What I suggest doing is just go ahead and copy these. You can also put them into a reusable pandas file. For my class, I don't really make this a library or anything. I like to sort of emphasize that they're really pretty simple functions. Each one of them is not that many lines of, of pandas code. It just keeps you from having to reinvent the wheel on all these sort of operations that I commonly do. So you have the you have the file here or in the cell. I'm going to go ahead and run that. Little star there indicates that it's running. As soon as we have a number it's done. Okay now that that's done we need to just set up some some data to actually load in a pandas data frame. Okay, at this point, the data frame is read in. If we just do this, it shows you the data frame. This is the classic Iris data set. So now we can do some transformations on it with these other functions. So let me just start sort of at the beginning and I will go through uh, each, of, each of the functions and show you some of the things that it might affect on that, on that data set. I'm actually going to have two data sets so that we have some different types of data to actually look at. So now I have two data sets loaded. I can, I can see the iris or I can see another data set that is the miles per gallon for, for cars. Both of these have different types of data that will help me illustrate the, uh, the functions that we're going to make use of. First we'll look at encoding dummy variables. So if we look at the iris data set, we can see that we have a we have four columns, the sepal length and width, the petal length and width. Those are numeric values. And then we have the species. The species is text. So we don't want to do any sort of fancy natural language processing on that. It's a categorical. There are three different distinct species types that are in the iris data set. What you often want to do with a species such as that is, or a categorical value, is we want to encode that into dummy variables. So since there are three distinct species of iris, we would like to blow that out to three fields so that we have um, one that has a value of one if it's, if it's iris setosa, and then the other two will be zero. 
Then the uh, next dummy variable is for the next species, and then the third is for the third one. So you you basically put three sort of Boolean on-off values, and only one of them will ever be true, indicating which of those three species it was. To do that, you make use of the encode text dummy ver uh, function. So now it's encoded, so let's print it out again. This said that we want to use the, this is the data frame that we're passing in, and we wanted to encode species. So let's just see what effect that had. Look at this. You'll see that the three dummies were added. So we have species Setosa, species Versicolor, and species Virginica. Those are the three different types of iris. And now you have all of these. If you go through the entire thing, now it switches to the last one. The rows in the middle are cut out, so we never see the middle iris, but it it has effectively turned those into dummy variables for us. When you are accepting something like the iris species as one of the inputs, so it's not what you're trying to predict. If you're trying to just send values in as part of the input, that's how you'll encode it, as dummy variables. However, for the iris set, Often you will not, or usually you're trying to predict the species. So in that case, you will do something different. You'll index encode it. So let me go ahead and run this part again. All I did there was just reload it. So species is back to what it was before. But now if we try it this way, same sort of thing. It executed this, but notice it did return an array. So this, you would often want to capture that. So this encoded it to a index and it kept the species. So this this variable that we assigned here, this is the species. So this is a lookup table. If we look at what it did to the data set, we'll see why we need that lookup table. Here you can see that it replaced species, but species is no longer a, uh, a text value. It now is an index, zero, and two. Again, the middle ones were cut out. So that zero means that it is the first one. So those zeros used to be Iris Setosa. And the, the twos used to be Iris Virginica. The Iris Versicolor, the blue flag Iris, is the ones in the middle that all got cut out. So you don't see any of the ones, but they, they are there. Trust me on that one. So now let's try to encode something else. I'm going to go ahead and reload my data set because I've modified it. And we'll see that Iris is, is in fact reloaded. Let's try to encode one of these as a z-score, just to see what a z-score looks like. Let's do sepal length. Okay, now the, the sepal length is a z-score. And you can see that here. Z-scores, if you're not familiar with them, they're basically like grading on the curve. So a value of zero would mean that that particular sepal length was exactly the average of all of the sepal lengths. A value of negative one means it's one standard deviation below the mean of, or the average of all sepal lengths. And a value of positive one means it's one standard deviation above. So this makes outliers very vis very apparent. If you see large values like three or higher, typically these are outliers. What's good about z-score encoding is if the values are in very different ranges. In the iris data set, it's really not that necessary because these values are all pretty close, but it normalizes them. It would be like saying you, you managed to buy something for $10 less than, than normally paid for it. If that's a book, that's a probably a pretty good deal. If it's a house, that's probably not so good of a deal. So looking at it as a z-score normalizes all of those to the same range. They're all going to be in the range of around negative 2 to positive 2 plus, plus outliers that'll have much bigger values. So it's a lot like an average. So if we look at the miles per gallon data set, we can see that... Um, it, the horsepower column, there are missing values there. They probably, nope, there they are. See that NAN? Not a number. That is a missing value. 
that'll cause all kinds of havoc if you try to pass that into a neural network of some sort, or most models. So we would like to replace that. There's all kinds of ways to replace a, a missing value, but what we're going to do here is simply replace it with the median. Now it's important to say that the median calculation is the median of horsepower with the missing values gone. You can't put a you can't typically calculate a median with missing values in there. There's there's some techniques for doing that. Usually you just calculate it on what's what's not there. So let's go ahead and do that. So now that we have replaced the missing median or the missing values with medians, we can look at the miles per gallon and we'll see that the accelerations now have no missing values. The, NA, the NANs are gone. I do provide another function missing default. You can default them to a certain value like zero if you so desire. I also provide a function to remove outliers. So if we look at the length of the miles per gallon data frame, it's not very big, it's 398 cars. We can remove all of the rows where outliers exist. So let's go ahead and try that on the acceleration. So if we execute this, what that says is any acceleration that is more than plus or minus three standard deviations, remove. So anything that has a three plus or minus standard deviation is, is usually considered an outlier. Now remember, we had 398 rows. Now let's see how many rows we have. 396. So it removed two rows that were outliers. Those were cars that were either really, really fast on acceleration or really, really slow. Okay, we're going to look at one last of my functions that I provided for encoding these. So I've encoded the iris data set so that the species is, a, is an index now. That's evident by this. Now we want to change this into two numpy arrays, x and y, for the neural network to predict or to, to fit on. So X is going to be what we're providing it to predict. Those are those four. And then Y is what it's trying to predict. So since species is a index, a discrete integer value, my function that I provide to encode into two numpy arrays will detect that and make it a classification problem. So what we're going to do is do the function called 2, 2xy. What this says is take the iris data frame and use species as the target. So species is going to become the y. And what it does is it creates two numpy matri matrices. So if you look at this, if it's numpy, you can always do shape on one of these two and it will tell you the shape. So there's 150 rows in the iris data set, and there's going to be four values. Those are the four measures of the, um, of the iris. So if we print out X, this is what it looks like. It is, so those are the measures, all four of them, and, and they're as an array, a numpy array. If we print out Y, so this is, this is what the, this is what it's trying to fit to. These four inputs are that. Notice there's no there's no column names because it's now just a pure numeric matrix ready to go into the neural network for fitting. This is input neuron one, input neuron two, input neuron three, and input neuron four. If we do Y shape, 150 comma three. Why are there three values? Well, this is a classification neural network, so we're assuming that the outputs are going to be, so you're trying to classify three irises, so you're going to have three output neurons, dummy variables essentially. So since the input went into 2xy as integer discrete values, it assumes that it's classification and it creates a it creates the correct, the correct type of matrix, which is dummy variables. And there you can see that's all ready for TensorFlow to predict on, or to uh, build a, to fit on, and then later predict. Okay, so those are all of the functions that I provide for my class. They're very useful for, uh, for pandas. Most of them are not very long. I mean, the things that I'm doing is automatically naming the dummy variables, 
adding the dummy variables and making sure to delete the value that came from the dummy variables. So they're all just relatively, um, relatively straightforward. I will show you the one last function that I saw up there that I almost forgot, HMS string. I do this when I'm timing things. It basically just prints out um, an, elapsed, an elapsed time. So that was 60 seconds, which is a minute. And if my pro, that way I can time things, see how long they take, compare CPU to GPU, that kind of fun thing. And it, however many seconds is in there, that's how many it's going to pr print in a more readable form is 60,000 seconds. What does that really mean to me? But 16 hours, 40 minutes, um, that means something more to me. All right, this is the end of this presentation. Thank you for watching. If you would like to stay up to date on other things that I do, go ahead and subscribe in YouTube and you'll get such updates. Thank you for watching.